Hi, welcome to Around the World in 80s Movies. I'm Vince Leo. I'm the author of the film review website, Quipster.net. I've been doing film reviews since 1996. I invite you to check out all of my written work at that website, Quipster.net, Q-W-I-P-S-T-E-R. Net. If you don't want more of my writings, you can also check out my other podcasts where I cover brand new movies that are out in theaters, VOD streaming services, wherever you get your movies. I talk about some of them on the Quipster Film Review Podcast, my companion podcast to this, and you can find the link to that at my website, quipster.net. Today I'm going to be getting into the second of a four-part series looking at the Jaws films, and just like the previous one, this one is set in the 1970s, which makes, I think, three of the last four films that I've covered on Around the World in 80s movies from the 70s. So I apologize for that. That just happens to be how the franchises run. Jaws 2 is the film I'm going to be talking about today. It came out in 1978. It does return Roy Scheider as the star. Lorraine Gary, Murray Hamilton, Joseph Mescolo, Mark Gruner, Keith Gordon, Mark Gilpin, Ann Dusenberry, Donna Wilkes, and Billy Van Sant fill out some of the smaller roles. The director is Jano Schwark, and the screenplay is credited to Carl Gottlieb and Howard Sackler. It's a PG-rated film. It does have violence and language. This predates PG-13, which it definitely would get today. The runtime is an hour and 57 minutes. Now, shortly after the monumental success of 1975's Jaws, Universal Pictures, they wanted Steven Spielberg to follow that up with another entry as part of this four-picture deal that he had signed with them, but he didn't bother to entertain that offer. He had already made the ultimate shark movie, at least in his mind, and following that up would only lead to disappointment, especially in the 1970s. In that era, the film industry viewed sequels as very inferior forms of films. Nowadays, of course, we view this as a given if the film is successful. The producers of Jaws, Richard Zanuck and David Brown, they did not think that Jaws needed a sequel, but Universal was going to make it with or without them. They had first dibs rights on a sequel if they were going to move forward, and if they chose not to be involved, that would be like giving millions away and to a competitor, no less. But what should they do for a follow-up? They didn't know quite what to do, so Universal approached the author of Jaws, Peter Benchley, if he had any ideas of what he would do for a follow-up. Benchley mentioned a few ideas, one of them being a mythical 100-foot shark that they find somewhere, but Benchley became too involved in writing his next novel called The Deep to script. Author Arthur C. Clarke, he was approached for a script. He suggested a film that was not a shark, but something kind of similar to Jaws, something called Tentacles, in which a giant squid threatens an oil refinery in the Indian Ocean, a notion that he had for a long time to make into a film. That idea was deemed by Universal as too far afield from where they wanted to go. Playwright Howard Sackler, he had performed uncredited work on Jaws. He thought that they should make a prequel that involved a young Quint during the sinking of the USS Indianapolis during World War II. That's the story that Quint relates very famously in Jaws. He thought that should be a feature film unto itself. But Universal Pictures head Sid Sheinberg said no. He said that the public wanted more Jaws. They wanted more Brody. They wanted more Amity, more of Mayor Vaughn, more of the beach community in danger. They wanted to see a sequel to what they saw in the first film, not a prequel. So they would have to get Roy Scheider to return. But Roy Scheider did not want to. In his mind, the first film could never be topped, and the shoot for Jaws was so grueling that he didn't intend to go through that hell again, to quote a line that he uses in this film. However, Scheider was signed to a three-picture deal with Universal after he had made Jaws. He was just finishing up the first, a film by William Friedkin called Sorcerer, but his next slated film, he unceremoniously bailed on. That was The Deer Hunter, eventual Best Picture winner, because of changes that were made to his role. It was later recast to Robert De Niro. Universal Pictures leveraged that incident to pressure Scheider into making Jaws 2. Scheider would go in kicking and screaming. He smashed up his hotel room at the Beverly Hills Hotel to make them think that he was having a mental breakdown. He was hoping they would scrap the idea of moving forward. Now, to get Scheider to play ball, to carry through the Jaws 2 project to completion, 
Universal Pictures negotiated a new deal with him. They offered Schneider four times the salary that they gave him for Jaws that made it about $500,000. He also would receive a percentage of the profit and they would count it as two films in their deal and that would end his contractual obligation for the three-picture deal once it was completed. He would also receive an additional $35,000 for every week that the shoot ran over schedule. This was an offer he could not refuse. It was too sweet to pass up, and he really couldn't refuse it anyway. He was stuck in the contract. Because Sid Sheinberg wanted more Jaws, Zanuck and Brown, they actually wanted that to be the title of their follow-up, More Jaws. But market testing found that the potential audience viewed the title More Jaws as something that they would give to a humorous or frivolous film. So they reluctantly went with the more boring title of Jaws 2, This would be kind of novel, I guess, in one respect. This was Hollywood's first use of the numeral 2 instead of a Roman numeral 2 for a sequel title. So to move forward, they needed a completed script to work with. So they reached out to Jaws co-writer Carl Gottlieb. He was asked to script. He had done the final script for the original Jaws. So they returned to David Brown's friend, Howard Sackler, and he took the job. Sackler incorporated elements from Benchley's Jaws novel that were previously left on the cutting room floor, such as the mayor's involvement with the mob on a real estate deal, an affair potentially for Ellen Brody, and financial repercussions for the island of Amity. Sackler envisioned an Amity with a paranoid Brody on edge patrolling, and Mayor Vaughn courting this real estate developer who was looking to build a resort and condominiums locally. A new character named Boyle would come to Amity to turn Quint's Shark Shack into a tourist attraction. Brody ends up losing his job because he claims that there are shark attacks occurring, but he does not have any evidence. Eventually, he's shown to be right all along. And then Brody and Boyle hunt for the shark on the real estate developer Peterson's yacht, only to find that the shark is really hunting them. And then the shark at the end dies by getting shredded in the yacht's propellers that they put down. That was the original concept by Sackler. Now, Ellen Brody's affair in the Peter Benchley novel was with the Matt Hooper character, the one that was played by Richard Dreyfuss. So they asked Richard Dreyfuss if he was interested in coming aboard. He did not have a contract like Scheider did because he was expected to die at the end of Jaws, but he did not for reasons I covered in the previous episode of this podcast. Because Richard Dreyfuss was working on Spielberg's Close Encounters of the Third Kind, They thought about recasting the Matt Hooper character. One option that they had was Swedish actor Erlen Josephson. Josephson declined. He stated that he'd rather have intellectual battles with Liv Ullman on the screen instead of fighting some shark. So because time was of the essence, they opted to just cut out the role and just proceed forward without this angle. Now for the director, Howard Sackler recommended somebody that he had come to know through his own social circles, a man named John Hancock. Hancock was... Uh, An experienced director, he had directed the acclaimed 1973 baseball drama called Bang the Drum Slowly. He also had some horror experience. He had directed the 1971 chiller called Let's Scare Jessica to Death. He still was an odd choice to take on a blockbuster shark film, though. But the producers, who were personally familiar with Hancock, they reasoned that his eclectic background might work in the sequel's favor. So Hancock took the job because he thought he would never get another opportunity to make a big action picture, something he was curious he could pull off. And he developed a surprising excitement to do it, at least at first. Hancock felt Sackler's script, though, Even though he was kind of a friend, or at least an acquaintance, it was uninspiring. He felt that Sackler's heart was obviously not in the project, so he needed to polish it up, and he asked a screenwriter named Nancy Dowd, who had done work for Slapshot. He thought the dialogue in that was great. He thought that she could provide a touch-up with all of the dialogue and the characters. Dowd declined, though, so Hancock, he talked to his actress wife, Dorothy Tristan, who was interested in doing some writing. She wanted to give the script a read, and after she was done, she offered a few suggestions that she thought would make this more exciting and scary. So she wrote down some notes. 
Hancock loved his wife Dorothy's ideas, so he relayed her recommendations to Zanuck and Brown. And they liked them too. They told Hancock and Tristan that they should revise Sackler's script with these new ideas. Tristan, she cut out characters like Boyle, and she put in teenage characters into the story, including one that was revealed to be the son of Quint from the first Jaws, who was at Amity and wanted to collect the shark hunting reward that was meant for his father. Tristan also came up with the shark in Jaws 2 having a more emotional tie-in. The shark would be the pregnant mate of the shark from the first film, basically getting revenge. And she also developed a different ending, not the yacht propeller. She thought that was dumb. She thought the new ending would involve this electrical cable under the ocean that would electrocute the shark in the end. The producers saw the revisions and they seemed enthusiastic. Sid Scheinberg felt that putting teenagers into the film especially would vastly increase the merchandising opportunities, so he also approved. So they moved forward. Now, despite production problems and some bad sentiment that occurred on Martha's Vineyard where Jaws was filmed by the locals, the producers felt that things should be better for the sequel because they only planned to do some exterior work in Edgartown before they relocated the shoot somewhere else. To reduce strain and expenditures, they would need to shoot somewhere else for the ocean scenes. After contemplating uh, the Carolinas and Guaymas, Mexico, production designer slash associate producer slash second unit director Joe Alves, he suggested a place that he had visited in and around Navarre Beach in Florida, that's near Pensacola, for the ocean shoot. The water there is warmer. The ocean offshore, it's deep enough to put the mechanical sharks in without going too far. And the area happens to be less trafficked by other boats, which were a lot of things that delayed the first film. However, casting would prove to be kind of a challenge because a lot of the actors that they were hiring locally for the Martha's Vineyard shoot would also have to travel away from home for several months in order to shoot in Florida. So that limited their options quite a bit. Now, after three weeks of shooting in Martha's Vineyard, creative differences did emerge. Hancock and Tristan's tone of their film was decidedly dark. They had a PTSD-afflicted Chief Brody hallucinating sharks everywhere he looks. Hancock saw the story for Jaws 2 as bleak and depressing. He wanted Amity to be like a ghost town. It was full of fog and darkness, and he wanted to evoke the financial despair that they were all undergoing. Zanuck and Brown insisted, though, that the film should resemble the first Jaws. It should be sunny, it should be warm, it should be colorful. Hancock did not like these suggestions. He grew incensed, and this opened up a host of grievances that he unloaded on Zanuck and Brown. He complained that the shark, even after a year and a half, it just never worked. He became wary of these artistic conflicts that occurred between the producers and Sid Scheinberg, as well as within the cast. There was just too much bickering. He felt pressured by Sid Scheinberg himself because he was pushing to get his wife, Lorraine Gary, a much more prominent role, especially in the climax. He felt alienated because a disgruntled Roy Scheider constantly criticized the dialogue and he started changing his lines and he told other actors to change their lines too, which really set back the shoot for those actors who had come prepared. So after hearing from several crew members that John Hancock was making continuity mistakes galore in his filming and he was producing unusable results, Sid Scheinberg decided to pay a visit to the shoot. He observed the footage that Hancock had shot firsthand. And from there, he wanted Hancock just gone. And he was going to replace Hancock with Universal's vice president for feature production, Verna Fields. She was the editor for the first Jaws. She received an Academy Award for that. Joe Alves was also offered directorial duties to support Fields. They were going to be put in immediately to avoid a lengthy search for a new director because they wanted to meet the deadline of June 16th, 1978. They'd already made promises and they didn't want to pay back all those millions of dollars for the advances. Although Zanuck was against the move because it shifted too much power to the studio by giving Alves and Fields directorial power, they were offered the job nonetheless. However, they could not get the necessary Directors Guild waiver because they were not DGA members and they had no prior directorial experience and the DGA did not like people ascending, especially non-Guild members, into replacing those who were part of the Guild. At this point, experienced directors like Otto Preminger and John Frankenheimer, they offered to step in, 
but they wanted several months worth of preparation time before they began, something that really they could not afford to wait for. The producers then asked Joe Alves, who was finishing production design on Close Encounters of the Third Kind, to see if he could ask Steven Spielberg if he might change his mind and be interested again. And Spielberg softened up on the idea now that he was finishing up on Close Encounters. He said he would do it, but he had hefty conditions. He needed at least two months more to work on post-production for Close Encounters, and he wanted six additional months to develop Sackler's USS Indianapolis idea, one that was struck down by Sid Sheinberg long before. He also wanted a million dollars and a substantial profit percentage. Given that they had already blown $5 million on John Hancock's shoot, they didn't want to scrap everything and start over and take a bath financially from postponing their release date. And on top of that, a sizable cut of profits demanded by Spielberg. So they opted to decline, and they would just have to find a director that was willing to start and pick up the pieces as quickly as possible. Now, after everybody else that they had on their list turned them down, the producers settled for this French-born journeyman TV director that was recommended by Alves from their days working on the TV show Night Gallery, Jeannot Schwark. Schwark said he could get everything back up and running within three weeks, something that was music to their ears, and he would start by shooting a big action sequence meant to be put at the beginning of the film while they retooled the production and redeveloped the script. Zanuck and Brown considered it a good omen that Schwark had a similar background to Spielberg. Both were self-taught directors with a passion for cinema, and they both came from working on Night Gallery. Schwark applied a different approach to Spielberg in terms of what he was going to do with the shark. Spielberg did not show the shark until the second half of Jaws. Schwark felt that there was no need to hide a shark that the audience had already seen, so he would show the shark as much as possible to differentiate it from Spielberg's movie, and he would surprise audiences by doing things with that shark that they might not expect. One new invention was showing the shark's point of view that was done by having a cameraman in a saddle atop the mechanical shark's back. And the shark would also do crazy, unexpected things. For instance, in one scene, it attacks an amphibious helicopter. The three mechanical sharks from Jaws, they were considered unusable. They were left to rot on the universal lot, except for their outer frames. Once again, Alves sought out Bob Maddy to design more sophisticated sharks using those frames. They would have adjustable heads, and the pneumatics inside would handle a variety of new maneuvers. Now, Spielberg had dubbed that shark Bruce for the first film after his lawyer, Bruce Raymer. The new shark, depending on where you read it, it's either called Bruce 2 or Brucette because uh, it's kind of a carryover from when it was meant to be a pregnant female shark. It would be called Scarface because it had a burnt head after what happens in the first scene. Or it was also called Fidel after Fidel Castro, who extolled the virtues of the first Jaws, which he viewed as a brilliant metaphor for the evils of capitalism. Regardless of whatever you call the shark, for the final script, they hired Jaws co-writer Carl Gottlieb, and they would pay him much more than the price that he had originally asked for when they turned him down. Gottlieb streamlined the teenage characters because Quark said that there were too many teens and a lot of the actors were very similar, tall, blonde, beach boys. Mark Gilpin was hired to replace six-year-old Ricky Schroeder for the role of the youngest Brody kid, Sean. And that was because Schwark said that Schroeder came across as excessively whiny and he was too pretty to be the son of Martin and Ellen. Tegan West, he was originally cast by Hancock to play Mike Brody, the elder son. He would get recast by Mark Gruner. They also reinstated Jeffrey Kramer to play Deputy Hendricks from Jaws. Kramer had dropped out of Hancock's version when he lost most of his lines to another actor that Hancock personally liked better, Marshall Efren. But Schwark loved Deputy Hendricks in Jaws, so he wanted him back and he removed the other deputy when Kramer returned. Actor Dana Elkar, he was hired by Hancock to play Peterson. He was going to be the mob boss, but Schwark replaced him with a favorite actor of his own, Joseph Mascolo, and they would rewrite the Peterson role to be less menacing, and they would rework the affair subplot with Ellen Brody. They softened up his character so he would be more appealing should they go that route. Gottlieb added more personality traits among the teens to try to distinguish them. He also invented a new youth culture for Amity, 
a culture of sailing as a means for them to hang out and connect, kind of like going out cruising in cars for landbound teens. They would go out on their catamarans and sailboats and whatnot. The teen actors were all involved, but they had a great deal of downtime, which in addition to the, a lot of romances forming as well as cliques, it allowed them to improvise skits and other character touches that Schwark used in the film. But not everything went swimmingly. Problems with the ocean chute persisted. Sailboats would run into cables. Ship traffic in the background caused a lot of delays. Naval jets would fly overhead regularly because it was near Pensacola's naval base. The mechanized sharks needed fixing all the time. And there were two hurricanes that paused the production for a significant amount of time. The first assistant director, he injured his spine when a swell knocked him into a boat. One of Bob Maddy's crew suffered broken ribs after he got crushed by the shark machinery. Divers were getting stung by whatever was below, jellyfish and whatnot. And their star, Roy Scheider, he also cracked a couple of ribs when he slipped on the deck of the police boat. David Brown, after all of this calamity, called Jaws 2 the most dangerous film ever made. And the danger was not just in the ocean. Schwark and Scheider, they butted heads daily behind and in front of the cameras, and that forced David Brown to have to intervene. Scheider contended that Schwark spent so much time with the mechanical shark and all of these teen actors and the extras that he felt neglected as the star of the film. Schwark countered that with all these technical problems and inexperienced actors, the film was the most important thing. He didn't think that he needed to also cater to his star's ego. And when he said that, that sparked a physical altercation that resulted in David Brown getting in between them. And then Verna Fields, who was also in the room, she sat on top of them all in the melee to try to get them to stop. And she said, do not hit Roy Scheider in the face. He was the star. When she did that, they all broke up into laughter and after their laugh, they had a mutual understanding. From then on, Schwark checked in with Scheider for input and creative opinion, but Scheider still grew increasingly unhappy as the shoot dragged on for several more months. Another setback occurred when David Brown received a message from one of his spies on the set that Murray Hamilton, the actor who played the mayor of Amity, he was on the verge of quitting. So Brown went to the set. He caught Hamilton. He had his bags already packed. He asked him, why? Why is he leaving? Hamilton explained that his wife was having a biopsy for cancer. He had to be there for her. He didn't care about anything else in his life. But if Hamilton quit at that moment, they would have to recast the part. They would have to rewrite the script. They would have to reshoot any scenes he was in, which was substantial. And that would probably cause them to miss their pre-book date and they would lose millions in advances. So Brown convinced Hamilton, give them two more days to shoot the remainder of his scenes. Hamilton, being the professional actor that he was, consented to two days. They brought all of the actors in that were supposed to be in his scenes, and they shot the remainder of Hamilton's scenes before letting him go. By the way, Hamilton's wife did not have cancer, luckily. Now, the shoot in Florida, when Hancock was originally the director, it was supposed to be done in August, but it extended more and more all the way into December. And that's when the water there was freezing, and they decided that they were just going to plow through. They would give nobody any days off. Additional pickup shots would take place in California, at Santa Catalina Island, and in Long Beach, and at the back lot at Universal. They reshot scenes from Martha's Vineyard with a brighter and more optimistic view of Amity. Schwark wanted a glossier look. He estimated that only about 90 seconds of his completed film is footage that was done by Hancock. In fact, Schwark caused Hancock's work the worst thing that he had ever seen in his life. He was not a fan of what Hancock was doing with the film at all. Now, as far as the finished story, Jaws 2 is set four years after Jaws. And that was primarily because the actors that played the Brody kids were actually significantly older, so they had to forward the timeline a little bit. It all took place in the same island community of Amity, and that's where we find Chief Brody still patrolling, although he's still shaken from his ordeal with the shark from the first film. Mayor Vaughn, he's catering to this land developer on the construction of new waterfront condominiums that will be very lucrative for this town that is still struggling to bring in tourists after the shark attacks of the past. But calamities start to occur again in the ocean, and Chief Brody becomes suspicious that there's another shark on the prowl. Once again, the mayor and the city council of the town refuse to listen to Brody because of their economic interests. Brody still persists, and after an incident in which he starts shooting his gun into the ocean and scares all of the tourists away, he loses his job. But he still must act 
this time as a father, when his sons and their friends become stranded in the ocean with no one but a crazed shark in sight. Now, unlike the first Jaws, there was no best-selling Peter Benchley novel to help whet the appetite in anticipation for the film. So they commissioned a novelization of Jaws 2, hoping to generate similar buzz from book readers. However, the Hank Searles novelization was based on the Dorothy Tristan revision to the Howard Sackler screenplay, so it differed substantially from the finished film that was scripted by Gottlieb and very much ad-libbed by a lot of the cast. Bantam had the first chapter published in over 31 major publications and magazines to try to promote the book and the movie in anticipation. And also, a lot of merchandising was done, much more so than on the first film, in order to get that teen demographic to come out and see the film. Jaws 2 had started with a budget of about $10 million, just slightly more than the first film, which, considering how popular the first film was, it was the highest grossing film of all time, really, was still pretty low, but all of these prolonged delays, the reshoots, the personnel issues, the locale changes, all of that would escalate the budget greatly, about three times, in fact. About $30 million is what Jaws 2 cost, and that made it Universal's most expensive film to that date. Still, Universal need not have worried, because Jaws 2, it really was coasting off of its predecessor's popularity. It scored $77 million in the United States alone, and $106 million additional dollars internationally, and that would make Jaws 2 the highest grossing sequel of all time, at least until 1979's Rocky 2. Now free from contractual obligations, Roy Scheider proclaimed he was never going to do another Jaws movie. He had experienced enough ocean and boats and fake sharks to last him a lifetime. He was not a fan of the sequel either. The biggest compliment he really gave is that it manages to hold together. Spielberg, by the way, watched what they did with Jaws 2 and did not think it was a good film at all, and that really turned him off from returning to the Jaws franchise altogether after that. Now, I do think that although it does not come close to the masterpiece that was the original Jaws, Jaws 2 still dishes out the carnage and the modest scares that I think audiences are going to expect. And while he's no Steven Spielberg, Jeanne Schwark delivered the film to the finish line in a respectable fashion. He held the challenging shoot together skillfully, and he produced an entertaining enough movie for the fans. Roy Scheider's performance in particular lends a lot of credibility to Jaws 2. Whenever he's on screen, the film comes close to capturing the intrigue that makes the original film so riveting. Unfortunately, since he's not the only one in peril, in fact, he's off the screen quite a bit, that necessitated all of these inexperienced, unknown teen actors to take center stage for long stretches of this film. While they're not terrible, they're still a far cry from evoking the masterful chemistry that we witnessed in the first film with Robert Shaw and Richard Dreyfuss and Roy Scheider. It just was never going to be replicated by these teens we barely get to know and we really barely like. Now, there are some impressive shark attacks to be found in Jaws 2 as well, but I think what really is missing here is the ability to shock the audience. We've already seen the shark and what it can do from a deadliness standpoint in the first Jaws, and that relegates Jaws 2 to just a lot more of the same. Without many thrills, Jaws 2 goes through a lot of predictable motions. It occasionally does rise to the surface with a new twist, but it also remains stagnant for long periods in between. I think trimming out some of the excessively long sailing shots might tighten the pace. The middle third of this film in particular really sags from a lot of uneventful scenes. Things do pick up speed again for a relatively lively finale, though. I think Jaws 2 is a giant step down from the landmark first film, but it definitely is way better than the other Jaws sequels, and all of those infinite amount of knockoffs that glutted the theaters in the post-Jaws era, it is far better than any of those. And it may not get the adrenaline pumping as you experienced in the first film, but I do think it's not without merit. And Scheider, as I mentioned, he's still quite engaging in his best character portrayal in his distinguished career. It does lack the excitement and the sheer ferocity of Jaws, but I think that this sequel is worthwhile for all audiences clamoring for a continuation of Jaws and for that, I'm going to give it the most modest of recommendations. It delivered the goods that people expected. It may be in the most minimal of fashions, but I think that if you like Jaws, you might find 
Jaws 2 a passable entertainment. And that's enough for me to give Jaws 2 three stars out of four. Three stars on my scale means I do think that it's worthwhile for people who like this kind of movie. And by that, I mean people who like the first Jaws. If you really love Spielberg's Jaws and you like that atmosphere, that horror shark-based atmosphere, I think that Schwartz film does deliver the goods. So three stars out of four is the best I can give Jaws 2. If you have your own thoughts on Jaws 2 and you want to impart them to me, you can write to me. You can find my contact information on my website. That's at quipster.net, Q-W-I-P-S-T-E-R.net. While you're there, I do encourage you to check out all of my other links to my social media. And I also encourage you to read the other reviews that I have there, quipster.net. As far as what I'm going to be covering next week, of course, we're going to continue on with the Jaws series. And we're actually going to get into the 1980s with the next film. From 1983, Jaws 3, or as it was called in theaters, Jaws 3D, because it was a 3D movie when it was released, and I will be covering that on the next episode. Dennis Quaid stars in that one as Mike Brody, the son of Chief Brody, and I'll get into all of my thoughts, and there are many thoughts that I have on that film, and I'm looking forward to talking about that on the next episode, and thank you so much for listening and joining me on this trip around the world in 80s movies.